Um, so, Cleary, thanks for having a chat with me. Um, we're sitting here at the um, Advanced Delta Science course at the college. Uh, you are known as Mr. Gel. I'm not sure if that is uh, a phrase I'd personally like to have associated with me. But, um, um, you know, going back some years now, we looked at postmenopausal women, we looked at endometrial thickness, and, uh, and that was very much the thing which we concerned ourselves with when we were looking at endometrial pathology. But um, things have changed, really. Um, and listening to your talk today, my impression was that you'd use contrast almost with every patient who was coming to a bleeding clinic. Is that, is that how you see things? Almost. Yeah? I mean, um, the thing is, um, I, in, in the past, when the endometrium was thin, let's say, less than five millimeters, you consider it normal. Yeah. But uh, in these patients with uh, endometria below five millimeters, there are some patients with, with uh, uh, abnormality. And, uh, and I think if you, your threshold for uh, gel installation is lower, you still will uh, diagnose even more patients with disease. Being but I guess the first question would be, do they matter? I mean, you know, if you have these people with these tiny polyps, which we weren't seeing before, and, and, and actually, you know, you're saying that if they've got abnormal bleeding, we're missing something here, and if we take them out, we can cure them? Or, or what, what, do you, what do you mean? No, I, I think the problem is, is mostly that in those people with so-called thin endometria, uh, the, um, we don't see the endometrium properly from right to left, from, from, from uh, top to bottom, and that adding some gel installation in your uh, uh, examination, you will uh, have a better view on the hidden pathology. Okay. I think that's, that's one of the points. I, I think perhaps if you really don't want to, I promise, if you uh, want to be even more accurate, uh, if your threshold for uh, gel installation was three millimeters, probably you will pick up some more uh, uh, diseases. So, but you, so in postmenopausal women, you'd do it if it was a slightly thicker endometrium, say five millimeters? Yeah. Under that, you might say maybe no, maybe not. And then in people who are premenopausal, would you always use it because you have thicker endometrium, yeah. you can hide postmenopausal yeah. quite easily. Yeah. And I always sort of think the problem you have then is you find stuff you might not want to know about. In other words, little polyps that probably don't matter. Uh, and the data demonstrating that the bleeding problems get resolved by removing these polyps isn't fantastic. And we've heard data today as well saying 20% of polyps maybe disappear, maybe not, maybe they're just misdiagnosed, who knows. So you do wonder, don't you, whether you're just... That's true, that's you know, true. I mean, it's not because there's a polyp, it's a polyp at the cause of the, of the problem. Yeah, I mean, that's, who knows. That's, uh, in, indeed. And I think in the counseling of the patient, you have to tell that... But obviously, yeah, you see a, poly, a small poly, and you say, oh, I, I can remove it, but I'm not sure... Yeah, but doctors are great at doing that, aren't they? Just, oh, I found it, let's take it out. Yes. So we have to be a bit careful. The better our equipment becomes and the more sensitive our tests, actually you sometimes end up potentially doing more harm than good. That's, that's you know? And we heard Lil, Lil Valentin's talk where she was hystoscoping patients and getting normal bowel mucosa back as a, as a well she wasn't but one of her colleagues was <laughs> perhaps I should say quickly so you know that just illustrates how you can have a problem can't you I mean yeah. so you have to be careful that's certainly the problem that's certainly the problem I have, I have the problem that in the bleeding clinic the patient I referred to me and have already been investigated in, uh, by other colleagues and when they come to me I have the perhaps it's, it's the wrong the, the wrong attitude but I, I I can't permit me to, 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 to miss to miss a, a problem, so yeah. my examination should be the last one. Yeah. But uh, but indeed we induce a necessary uh, procedure. I'm I'm convinced we do. I think it's but I think we have we have to, to, to look, and I think that's one of the points we have to make clear in AITA. Is uh, um, well, just just to clarify, AITA is this international trial where you're trying to sort of um, standardise nomenclature for endometrial pathology and then right. look in quite a large, large multi-centre study so we actually get answers uh, to whether these types of pathology actually uh, are, are a problem. And, and right also right? To, see, to see if you can select perhaps a, a small, smooth polyp without a, without a feeding vessel. Yeah. It's probably not a real polyp but in any way can be left alone. If you see a small polyp but with a strong vessel, perhaps that's a, 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 a lesion that matters. 
Yeah. I mean, and that's so one it's of quite the obvious that not all politics are going to be the same. It's yeah. like anything else. Yeah. Not one one yeah. size never fits all in any kind of biological system. I just want to move you on to the practicalities. I mean, we all done saline installation. Um, and, you know, if you're like me, you, you, you get the cheapest little catheter, you put saline in it, and you get very wet feet, um, as, as, as we've all experienced. And so now you, you've moved on to gel. Yes. Um, not everyone's familiar with it. it. Does it mean there's anything different in terms of what catheter you use or um, equipment? Um, and what gel do you have to use? So if someone's listening to this podcast and they're thinking, how do I set up? How but do, what, things, what, we, do they need, what do they need? So we just... we use the, the same catheter we used for the saline infusion, we used for the gel infusion. Yeah. For the saline infusion, we used the cheapest catheter, and this was uh, a new needle uh, section. So catheter. you still use the same one? And we still use the same okay. one. Uh, the gel we use is uh, the uh, endos gel or instilla gel. This, this gel uh, mostly used by the, initially used by the uh, because I always thought it worked because yeah. instead of just got a bit of chlorhexidine in it, chlor- and I know that it's okay in urethelium, but I mean it's slightly different when you're putting it up the fallopian tubes. I mean, do you, you're quite comfortable with that. I did this, uh, a search of which uh, before I started to do that, and uh, of the use of chlorhexidine in, in, in gynae, in abdominal surgery, yeah. and apparently it does not. Uh, well, it's, you're happy with it. But, but, I, but I what do you do? I mean, you get a couple and of syringes, or and uh, so the syringes are are packed just one syringe and then one pack. It's sterile, obviously, it's yeah. sterile. And uh, is it a lure lock system? Or no, no, no. It's just in fact because it's it's initially uh, used in a, a neurology. It fits, it fits the urethra. Oh, okay, so, fine. I mean, but but uh, the the thing is, this it fits. Perfectly, the um, you need a suction catheter. Well, I know. The first time I used Stilogel, I'd stolen it from your, from yeah. your department. Oh, not stolen, anyone <laughs> at the university. I was given a, 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 <laughs> a trial. So, the thing is, we warm the, the gel a little bit yeah. on a, um, a little warming blanket. Does that reduce pain? Uh, yes, there's one, one paper, um, um, forgot the name, anyway, oh, um, yeah. who. Um, and, and it probably is a bit, flows a bit more, I imagine. And more. also the, the, the viscosity is somewhat lower. So uh, because we use a neonatal catheter of only 2 millimeter of, uh, of diameter, it's very thin. How often can't you get the catheter in? Is that ever a problem? No, I mean, we have a failure rate of 2%. 2% but but right. the, the thing is you have to, to, uh, to catch the, the, with your uh, swap forceps the catheter just at the tip and with little strokes you just push it up through the, the cervix and it's, it, well... I have no, no problem major with problem with that. Okay, and fertility patients you give covering antibiotics, but others you don't, is that right? Or yeah. something like that? Yeah, yeah. We, we don't. Is it or? Is it in, in, in fertility patients? Fertility but, patients. But not, not in, uh, On the same day or an hour or two before or something yes. like that? Yes, yeah. Okay, so you probably. Okay, so it's a pretty straightforward procedure as far as you're concerned. Yes, it's very okay. Yeah. And if you're comparing the data in terms of just doing an ultrasound, straightforward ultrasound scan without gel, What's the kind of relative sensitivity for focal pathology, would you say? Well, it's, it's much better. I, I don't have the figures in, the, in my head. Well, you can, you can, you can ballpark, ballpark figures. I mean, say the detection rate for focal pathology, I think, with B-mode imaging alone, just straight non-contrast imaging, it's about 50% or something, isn't it? It's not that high, but it's about, yeah, about, no, 80, it's about 88, 90% yeah. with, image, with, with gel, yes. which is about the same as hysteroscopy. Yeah, that's that's, it's, it's the, same, the same as hysteroscopy. But I guess the gel advantage just hangs around longer, so you don't have the fiddling around. It just sits in the cavity better. This, the, I, the advantage of the gel is that it stays in, in, in the cavity for some, some, some seconds, some, some minutes. Right. I mean, after a, but it's not that it stays there for days. No, no, no I wasn't <laughs> suggesting the poor lady walking around with jelly, kind of sitting there for no, days. No, 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 but the it is an issue, because I suppose some people would say, you know, if, who would, because I know you've done a paper where you demonstrated that you should, um, you know, about when you should do the biopsy before or after the scan. So, you know, if you're going to put the gel in, naturally you're going to do a scan, put the gel in, and then you do a propel. I guess you have to do two or three propels to get the gel out before you take the biopsy. Is it that, is, that, it that's is, what you do? It yeah. is. But the thing is, uh, the, the, the two uh, or three aspirations you have to do when you aspirate only gel are the least painful. Yeah. Because uh, as long as the, the... You're not actually the, scraping yeah. almost the end of the instrument. That's, that's, that's the thing. Yeah. So, is, you know, if you're 
in the office, I mean, the old advice then is that someone with abnormal bleeding, so it's just, let, most people don't have the luxury that we have an abnormal bleeding clinic, they're sitting in their office just seeing kind of regular patients, but um, would your view be that if their patient comes in with abnormal bleeding, they should all get gel? Bearing in mind that, you know, somebody's coming in there having a bit of bleeding on the pill. I mean, you're not going to do gel on them, are you? I mean, really? I mean, come on. Yeah, but I mean, I mean you do a perfectly nice normal scan and she's it, it, 30 it, it, years old. No, okay, no come no. on. If it's, if it's, it depends. Uh, is it the recurrent bleeding? Is it right. the first time? I mean, in a, in, in a young girl with <laughs> intermittent bleeding and pill, you, you don't do anything. I mean, if, the question is, do you scan her? But I mean, even if you scan her and, and you see it, it's normal, you, you don't do anything. But uh, so in recurrent bleeding, in postmenopausal bleeding, perimenopausal bleeding, always uh, I always use that. And even if, if there's, uh, in, in my uh, current practice in the region hospital where I yeah. also work, when I'm alone, I first do an ultrasound, and if I, uh, if I have any doubt, I do, I do a gel installation. And it takes, I just I measure, the, it takes me four to eight minutes. Exactly. I mean, it's very simple, isn't it? Really? Yeah. It's just, if you can do a, if you can take a smear, you can do a gel. I mean, it's not yeah. exactly yeah. difficult, is it? Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, Terry, thank you for your time. I'll probably see you next time in London. Yes, pleasure. <laughs>